And now. When you feel that, the only thing you can depend upon is the Lord. But before we go any further here, we're going to do something different again also. This sister here has a testimony of what God can do when we listen to the voice of God. Brothers and sisters, I just want you to know it's very humbly, so humbly. But I'm retired, and I get a lot of time, and I hear a lot of people, and I pray hours, and I thank God. Two weeks ago, he told me, he speaks to me, and I know his voice. And he said to me, that house there I want you to go to. And on the front of the house over there by the Washington School in Stillwater is the house that has the Christmas lights that read Jesus, white, a heart in red, and then you, Jesus loves you. I said, oh God, are you sure? I said. I don't even know who lives there. Uh, okay, okay. Sunday after that powerful service, the Holy Ghost, man, it was just bubbling and whatever. And he said, today's the day. Uh -huh. Okay. So I pulled up and pulled along the walk. And there was a little boy, probably four years old, in the doorway. I didn't see anybody else. And I said, honey. I said, is mommy and daddy home? Well, he came running like children do. And he said, uh-huh. Well, with that being said, here comes this man, a different nationality I didn't know where from, with a shovel in his hand, and he must have been doing behind the wooden area there by their house, something. And I said to him, oh, hello. I said, I want to just compliment you on what you have on the house. I said, it's a message and you never take it down. You let it there all year, but it shines in the Christmas season. He said, yeah. And I said, well, uh, Jesus. He said, Jesus. Me, me, we people, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah, that Holy Ghost. All right, then I said to him, well, I said, apparently you fellowship somewhere. He looked at me and he said, I do. But no Holy Ghost. No Holy Ghost, no worship. And that's what he said about three times. Oh, oh. I said to him, just a moment. I said, if I can go to my wallet, I'll get you a card. He said, church, Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost worship. And I said, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I run to my wallet. And I get it out, and I'm standing on the street there at the side, and I hand it to him. Fluent, fluent Holy Ghost. He started speaking Holy Ghost in tongues. I was Holy Ghost, and, and we were holding hands. And he looked at me, and he said, lady, you be of God. And I said, I just do what he tells me to do. He said, I look for church. I look for church, Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost and worship. I said, will you come on to the sanctuary? His name. Watch for him on Sunday. I just saw the little boy, and I just saw him. Don't know anything more. But he will be here. His name is Gonzalez Hernandez. He is from Honduras, Honduras, and he said, in my land, lady, 
We Holy Ghost and we worship. I, I tell you, God is. Praise God. Well, we, we've talked about that still small voice many times. And we need to listen to it. And the more you listen to it, the more familiar you will get with that voice. And that's what, that's what the prayer, that's what Bible study is all about, getting familiar with the Word of God. But more than anything else, getting familiar with our Redeemer, knowing who He is. But uh, I thought that was very fitting. She told that story to my wife, I believe it was last night, and I was studying for tonight. And uh, I've got an article I'm going to read here. But... Uh, it fit right in with there. And I titled it The Voice. But uh, we need to understand that we have to have the voice of God. We do. We are a unique people. We're a Holy Ghost people that have the anointing of God in our life. And we need to develop. Paul said, stir up the gift that is within you. In other words, when we need to be sensitive to the Spirit of God, we need to allow him to speak to us so we can hear it. Praise God. But I want you to bear with me with this. I got this on my internet here just a uh, couple of days ago. But uh, it kind of went along with what I wanted to talk about. Takes place in Alaska, brother. Brother Star. <laughs> here we go. I was in Alaska doing a lawsuit way out in the Aleutian Islands. Getting ready to leave for Anchorage and then home. I had a ticket in my pocket to get one a plane when a pastor came up and said, listen, I can save you some money. Who don't like to save money? I said, well, how's that? He said, I flew a small plane up here, and I can fly you back with me and save your ticket. I said, well, thank you very much, but I've also got this other lawyer that's with me. No problem, he says. So against my better judgment, I said, okay. Well, we went out to the hangar, and I took a look at the little plane, well, one good thing, it was shiny. That's always a good indication of a good plane, right? Nice and shiny. So he walked around and got in. He's on the left front. I'm in the right front. My lawyer friend behind me. It started up just fine. And, well, we taxied out. I said, should we pray? He said, yeah, that's not a bad idea. But normally we don't. I said, well, this time we're going to pray. And I prayed hard for about five to eight minutes. When we went and got on the runway, he starts down the runway and the plane lifts off just ever so gently. We started climbing and then it was wonderful, not a problem in the world. We flew three or four minutes and something happened that will never leave my mind. The pilot turned to me and said, we're going into the clouds, and I can't fly in the clouds. They make me pass out. I said, clouds make you what? Now it's been cloudy all day, and we go right into the clouds, and you can't see anything. And he looks at me, and his eyes roll back in his head, and he starts mumbling and passes out. Passes out cold. Now I grabbed him, and I shook him so I can kill him. Now we're in the clouds flying along with no pilot. And my friend in the back seat said, we're dead, aren't we? I said, there's a very good chance of that, yes. He said, what are we going to do? I said, I don't know. But there was a radio right there, and I handed him the microphone, and I said, start asking for help. So he grabs the mic and says, hello, hello. We didn't know proper etiquette. We all... All we knew was saying was hello, and somebody answered back, saying, don't you guys know proper radio etiquette? I said, we don't know nothing. I said, we tell him we're in an airplane with a passed out pilot, and we don't know how to fly this plane. The guy said, I'm a freighter flying out, flying out of Anchorage on my way to Tokyo, and you're telling me you have nobody who can fly that plane. I said, that is correct. Now you've got to understand, I'm sweating bullets. 
The other pilot said, first thing I'm going to do is start circling so I don't lose you. Otherwise, I'll lose contact with you. He said, I'm going to get Anchorage Emergency for you. They will be, able to, they will be the people that can sa save you. After about five minutes, Anchorage came on and said, we understand you have a passed out pilot and neither of you can fly. We said, that's right. They said, the first thing we got to do is find you. I'll never forget what this man from Anchorage said. He said, my job is to get you home safe. That's my job. But he said, here's the deal. If you want me to get you home safe, you got to listen to my voice. You can't see me, but I can see you. And if you don't obey my voice, you're going to die. When you can't see anything, you have no idea how disoriented you will become. Finally, he said, okay, I found you. Now hear me clear. You're four minutes from a mountain. You're going to crash into that mountain and die. Follow my voice. I never said I have to follow your voice. Is that reasonable? How many have heard that before? Follow God's voice? You hear voices? You see, I understood without his voice, I had nothing. And do you understand without God's voice, we have nothing? Absolutely nothing. Finally, he told us how to turn around and then said, I'm freezing all traffic in the area. It's going to take me an hour and a half to get you to Anchorage. There's a lot of weather between you and Anchorage. You're in for a rough ride. Then he said, I want you to hear me. I don't want you to look at what's going on outside. Hold on a second. Let's wash my place here. Okay, there we are. I don't want you to look at what's going on outside. I don't want you to pay any attention to the storm, just my voice. If you start watching the storm, you will die, but I can take you through it. Now, because they cleared all the traffic, several of those 747 freighter pilots listened to the voice, said, listen to the voice. That's the key. Do you realize your head is full of voices pulling you every direction? Know the voice of the master. But God says, I want you to be a living sacrifice. I want you to put yourself on the altar. Finally, we went through the worst of the weather, but there was still more. Then the voice from the tower said, now I'm going to line you up. I'm going to bring you in right down the runway. At the foot of the runway are some lights, and they're in the form of a cross. He said, don't forget this. That cross will bring you home. Finally, he's bringing us down. We still can't see anything. And all he kept saying was, stay with me. The Bible says the sheep know my voice. Finally, just a couple of hundred feet off the ground, we saw the cross. I landed the plane. In fact, I landed it seven times. Finally, we came to a stop, and the minute we stopped, the passed out pilot came to. The tower said, thanks for listening. He said, I watched them crash and burn all the time because they won't listen to my voice and depend on their own vision. The airport put us in the, up in the motel for the rest of the night. About four o'clock in the morning, there was a knock on my door. I opened it and there was a man standing there that said, hello, David. I said, you're the voice that brought me home. Do you realize one day we're going to stand before him and say, you're the voice that brought me home? If you're not in the altar. If we're not in the altar and we're not the sound of that voice, our heads will get filled with all the wrong voices. It's true. All the flocks of the sheep 
know their master's voice. You can have several flocks in there, but one shepherd can start walking out, start calling his sheep, and only his sheep will come to him. And we wonder why so many are confused, not knowing which direction to take in broken marriages, broken up families. There will always be storms. The Bible tells us there will be winds and false prophets and false doctrine. God's voice can guide us through. What we're seeing that's happening in the world today is very confusing. Things we thought we would never see. Things we thought we'd never see happen in America. The Bible is being tossed out the window and stomped on and ridiculed. But I want to tell you, we believe that the Bible is an infallible word of God. It has taken me through many, many storms. Now, I want to tell you what, God can take us through any storm, and there will be winds of false doctrine, and there will be winds of false prophets that are going to be coming. And we have to have the discerning of the spirits to keep us on course. And we have to keep our eye on that runway. And keep our eye on the cross. Praise God. While I was praying this last week or two, it was quite unique that the 23rd Psalm come to my voice again. It come to my mind. And many times we read over these verses. We see them time and time again. We just kind of skim over them. But we need to sit down and take a look at them. We don't want them to become common to us. I'm going to read the 23rd Psalm right now. It says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures, and he leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul, he leadeth me in the paths of righteousness. Can you say praise the Lord? Are you glad that the Lord can lead us down the right pathway? For his namesake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is the most quoted chapter in all of the Bible. It's quoted at funerals. It's quoted on the battlefield to dying soldiers to give them peace. It is a psalm of comfort and it's a psalm of hope. And that we know it is written by David, who was the shepherd king. What I'm going to do tonight is break this down Phrase by phrase. So we can remember. Sometimes, like I said, we, we go over the verses and we've hear, heard it so often that we forget the true meaning behind it. The Lord is my shepherd. John 10, 27 says, My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. Praise God. The Lord is the one that leads and guides me. My responsibility is to follow him. And if we are true sheep, we will follow that voice. I shall not want. The Lord said in the Old Testament, I am Jehovah Yaira, the Lord that provideth. Psalm 37, 25 says, I have been young and I, now I am old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging for bread. God is going to take care of us. I shall not want. Hallelujah. If I put my trust and my confidence in the Lord, I know that God is going to take care of me. You have to bear with me tonight. I 
losing it here. <laughs> I'm so thankful for what the Lord has done. Now think of the amount of times that God has provided. The times that I've lost my job, gone months, nearly a year without a job. But God had always provided every time. Praise God. That's another beauty of belonging to the house of the Lord. Praise God. We bear one another's burdens. And the important thing is that we are recognize other people's burdens. And I'm going to say this tonight. Sometimes we need to recognize that we're not the only one that has a problem. Everybody around us has a problem. And how we build relationships is when we care about one, an one another. I shall not want. We have each other to hold up one another. Joshua and Caleb, Caleb held up Moses' arms. We need to hold up the arms of our pastor. We need to hold up the arms of all of our leaders. Hallelujah. And we also need to hold up the, the arms of each one of us. Praise God. I am Jehovah Yireh, and the Lord that provideth. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. Sheep will, will stay in one place, and they will nibble and nibble and nibble, and they will eat the grass right down to the roots and kill the grass. The shepherd's responsibility is to take them on. After they have eaten so much, they need to move them back off again to another pasture because sooner or later they're going to need to come back again. That is the shepherd's responsibility. That's something that's so unique about the house of God and the word of God. We have to keep coming back again and again and again over the same territory. We need a, a pastor and the leaders that's going to take us from pasture to pasture that's going to keep us. And he will always take us to the green pastures, that which will give us nourishment. Yeah. Hallelujah. Our master will not allow us to stay in one place, but he leadeth me beside the still waters. Isaiah 9, 6 says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. Hallelujah. Jesus said, My peace I give to you. If you're troubled in your spirit, when you get a communion with God, the peace will come. I will guarantee when you turn everything over to the Lord, like that story said, I need to fall on the altar and find the place with God and realize that God is going to give me the peace that I need in the middle of the storm. Jesus said when they went through the storm the ship, all he said was peace be still and the storm immediately stopped. Hallelujah. Praise God. He leadeth me beside still waters. Psalm 91 and 1 says, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. It is important that we have our secret place with the Lord. We have to have the place that we can hide and be alone with God so I can hear His voice. And there's more to prayer than just speaking words. We have to, sometimes we have to stop and we have to meditate. And sometimes we have to listen for the voice of the Lord. It's not all talking. We need to allow a dialogue between myself and the Lord. We've got to allow him to speak to me. Praise the Lord. I remember David said, the Lord has spoken to me in the night seasons. How did he speak to him? He spoke to him not in an audible voice, but that still small voice that we spoke of earlier. God will speak to you. How many times have you and I been when we didn't know where to turn and was listening to the voice of the Lord, and the Lord came along and gave us the answer because we were listening to the voice. Praise God. Mark 4 and 39, And they arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. There is a calm that comes with the Holy Ghost. The Bible talks about in Isaiah 28 or 11th chapter, 
The 28th chapter and verse 11, it says, With stammering lips, one speak to this people. And this is the refreshing. And this is the rest. Wherein the weary are rested. Praise God. Are you thankful for the rest of the Holy Ghost tonight? That we can go to him. I don't know what anybody's going through here tonight. But I will guarantee you there are those that are probably going through a storm. The problem with life, you Heberts, is the fact that life is so daily. You ever hear that before? <laughs> life happens every day. Things go up and things go down. That's to how, level, uh, how life goes. But I want you to know that God is in the midst of it. Yeah. Praise God. There is nothing goes on that God does not know about. The worst storm that you've ever been through, God was in the midst of the storm. When they saw Jesus walking across the waters, it was not calm water. It was rough waters. And Peter said, Lord, bid me come. And they said, come. And he started walking on the water. Who knows what can happen when we listen to the voice of the Lord and allow God to speak to us. Praise God. He restoreth my soul. Psalms 51 and, chapter tw and verse 12 says, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. Praise God. David had sinned. He had committed adultery. And he had also committed murder. And God sent him a prophet. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad for the prophets of God? If the prophet never would have came, where would David have been? But we're thankful that there was a prophet that came to David and gave an illustration, and then pointed his bony old finger at David and said, Thou art the man. But not only did it stop there, but the David said, Against thee and thee only did I sin. I messed up. David repented, and he was seeking back again the restoration of the Spirit of God. There is always hope. The Bible tells us his mercies are renewed every morning. There is a reason that God put the entrance to the tabernacle on the east side of the tabernacle because that's where the sun comes up at. His mercies are renewed every morning. How far can you go away from God? What can you do that's going to make you eternally lost from God? Almost nothing. God forgives. God forgives. Praise God. He restoreth my soul. Joel chapter 2 and verse 25 says, and I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm, and the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. God promises, I will restore the years. I don't care how old you are or were when you came to the Lord. God will restore the years. One of the things that was so unique to me that I enjoyed so much I baptized a man that was 82 years old in the name of Jesus. Made an utter mess of his life. But God restored the years. Started bringing his family back together again. Are we ever too old? No, we're never too old. Hallelujah. Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Salvation is just not just a, a good feeling for a moment, but there is joy that goes along with it. It's what's going to keep us. And, and, and it says that the joy of the Lord is our strength. When I am full of joy, I am strong in the Lord. And David said, I want you to restore the joy of my salvation. And God is going to bring back together all the broken pieces. That's the God that we serve said, he leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Matthew 5 and 6, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Are you hunger for the righteousness of God? Or do you wish to take a different path? I want to tell you there is no greater blessing than following the Lord. 
Elijah said when he went before the, the, all the Baal worshipers, he said, who are you going to serve? If Baal be God, serve him. But if, God, if the Lord be God, serve him. Make up your mind. Which way do you want to serve? Because I want to tell you what. The joy of the Lord is on, on the side of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Praise God. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, Drew put something up on the internet the other day in the sanctuary. How many saw that? A few people did. I'm going to read it tonight. Drew Strepp said, this is something my nephew wrote that really spoke to me today. The overflow hidden in the valley. As I read through these verses sitting in my car today, I began to weep. I began to think about the valleys I have walked through. The valley of doubt, the valley of pain, the valley of trauma, the valley of addiction, the valley of a depression, the valley of loneliness, the valley of insecurity, the valley of fear, the valley of hesitation, the valley of unbelief, the valley of a dry spirit, the valley of where the God who I call shepherd seemed a million miles away, the valley of spiritual death. As I walked through these valleys in my life, the enemy began to convince me that these valleys were a punishment. I had this mentality that my valleys could be compared to a spiritual timeout or a dry season as God distanced himself from me. I began to wallow in self-pity and throw a tantrum at God, crying out altar call after altar call, why have you forsaken me? Why do you sit here watching me weep and do nothing? If you cared for me, take me out of this valley. If you loved me, you would place me in the green pastures. All while he echoed back, I have no oil for you in the green pastures. Let me say this. Your greatest anointing will not flow down from the mountaintops or the green, or the green pastures. It will flow let me never forget that even in the valley of the shadow of death, my cup still runneth over. Let me never forget that even in the presence of mine enemies, there is still no rest in your presence. I have run through the valley long enough. I am tired physically, spiritually, and emotionally. Tonight I sit down at the table you have prepared for me with expectation. Lord, wrap me in your arms. Give me the warmth only your love can supply. Reveal your promises once again. Tonight, I will rest in your peace, and I will let you fill my cup once again. Tonight, I lay down my weapons, and I let you fight the battle I have been trying to fight on my own for far too long. Lord, thank you for this dark valley, for you have been positioning me for my greatest overflow. Sincerely, someone who has been through some valleys. How many has been there at some of those places before? Depression, discouragement, felt like you were left alone, felt like God was a million miles away. Maybe you felt like you had blasphemed the Holy Ghost. If you have any desire for God at all, let me guarantee you, you did not blaspheme the Holy Ghost. Because if you did, you would have no desire and have no feeling towards God. I will fear, and I'm going to go on here with the rest of the chapter, I will fear no evil. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. I will fear no evil. Why should I fear what man can do unto me? No man can do anything unto me that God does not allow, and he is still in the midst of it. We get fearful, and sometimes we pray and say, Oh, God, work on this individual and do this or do that. But we need to recognize God is still in the midst of it. If you are following the Lord and doing everything that you know to do right, you just put your confidence in the Lord and put your trust in him. For thou art with me. We don't have any scriptures for that, do we? Deuteronomy 31 and 8 says, And the Lord, he is at thy, 
he, he, he it is that doth go before thee. He will be with thee. He will not fail thee, neither forsake thee. Fear not, neither be dismayed. God is with me. The Bible says that God will never leave nor forsake us. He's always going to be there. Do we depend on feeling? We do. When we feel empty, we feel like maybe God's not with me. We've all been there. We've all been maybe at the altar trying to feel the presence of God and have not felt anything. Has God left us? No, he has not left us. God is not a liar. Satan is a liar. He'll make you feel like you're empty, like God doesn't care. Nobody else cares about you. I want you to know the Lord is still with you. Praise God. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. The rod is used to ward off the varmints that, we would, attack, that would attack the flock. There's a protection. 2 Kings 6 and 17 says, And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about them, round about Elisha. We don't always see what's going on, but we can trust that God is still there. The Bible tells us that no man has seen God at any time. He is invisible. God is in here tonight. I can't see him, and I can't feel him with my hands, but I can feel him with my spirit. But even if I cannot feel him in my spirit, I know the Lord is here because his word says so. He is with us. He is in our presence. And the Bible says, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. We start to magnify the Lord. That is the key to feeling the presence of the Lord. Our worship gives us the ability to reach and feel after him. In the book of Acts, it says, feel after him. For he is not very far from every one of us. Praise God. Something, he says, thy rod and thy staff. The staff we know is a shepherd's staff. has a big old hook on it. The shepherds use a staff because it's very unique to shepherds. Hardly anybody else ever uses one. They use a little hook to pull the lambs out of trouble. Get them off of a cliff or out of a ditch or something. But there's something so unique also about a staff. He knows Moses had a staff. Abraham had a staff. Jacob had a staff. They all had a staff. What was unique about the staff and why it was so important was because they had their story written on the staff. Every time God did a miracle for them, it was put on the staff. Every time they went through a storm, they wrote it on the staff. So that staff was very important because it had their heritage on it. It says, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. When I look at the staff and I look at what God has done in the past, the storms that God has taken me through, I know that God will do it again. He will keep there with me. He will never leave nor forsake me, but he will always be there. I can look and see the glory of the Lord. And many times through the scripture we find the Lord said, do this to remember me. He put 12 stones in the Jordan River. He says, do this. Each tribe to put a stone in the river. And then when your ancestors come, your descendants come, and they say, what meaneth these stones? We can tell the story of how God brought us across the Jordan River on dry land. We can tell the story of how God filled us with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. We can tell how God changed our life when we were baptized in the name of Jesus. How things were changed, what God has done in our life. Have you got a staff tonight that you can go back to and remember what God has done? We need to remember what God has done. The devil wants us to forget, but God wants us to remember. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. The first thing that came to my mind was Psalms chapter 73, verse 1. It says, truly God is good 
to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped, for I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Have you ever been there before? Been down on the dumps, down in the dumps, and watched all these people go by that not serving God, going by in their fancy cars, pull into their fancy houses, and said, man, what's wrong with me? Why am I not blessed like this? But then the psalmist said, until I went into the sanctuary, then I understood their end. Hallelujah. Our home is not here. Our home is up above. Hallelujah. We know where we're going. Hallelujah. I know where I came from. I know where I'm at right now. And I know where I'm going. I see the lights of the cross at the end of the runway. I know where I'm going. I may not have all the riches of this world. But I want you to know I've got a joy of the Holy Ghost on the inside. I'm glad for what God has done. But I'm also thankful that I know where I'm going. Because one day he's going to wipe away all tears. There's not going to be any more sorrow. Sometimes in the flesh, that seems so small. But I want to tell you what. There's going to be one day that's going to come when the eastern sky is going to split. And we're going to meet the Lord in the air. Hallelujah. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. And there's going to be a new Jerusalem for us. Hallelujah. We're going to walk the streets of gold. Sometimes the devil wants to make that so, so small and insignificant. But if I didn't even see all of that, the joy of the Lord is worth it all. Praise God. If there was no heaven, I would still want to live this way because there is a blessing that goes along with it. There is peace in our hearts. There is joy in our hearts. There is fellowship. I can have true friends. Praise God. Praise God. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. 2 Corinthians 1.21 now he who establisheth us with you in Christ and hath anointed us is God. He which establishes us. Remember at the beginning I said there's going to be false prophets. There's going to be false doctrine that's going to come along. But I'm going to tell you what. God's spirit is stronger than the spirit of any deception. But you have to be able to listen to the voice of of the Lord. You got to recognize his voice. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hebrews 1 9 says, Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. And in conclusion, there, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Praise God. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me from the day that I committed myself unto the Lord until eternity. Hallelujah. Praise God. It's not just till the end of this life. The, from the day I gave my heart and my life to the Lord said, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Praise God. Aren't you glad we've got a hope beyond this world? Something is more powerful than the, the short things that's going to take place in this world. All these people looking for all the riches and wealth and power, it is going to be short-lived. One day it's going to come to, to an end, and they're going to stand before the throne of God, and the judgment of God is going to fall. Choose ye this day whom ye will serve. If it going to be the world or will it be the Lord? Shall we stand tonight? Now ask this question tonight. Is the Lord your shepherd? And do you know his voice? We are living, living in an extremely critical time. In fact, we are living also in a blessed time. We are possibly in the generation of the coming of the Lord. 
And I said that the latter rain is going to be greater than the former rain. There is going to be difficulty. It's going to be trouble. There's going to be all the stuff that you're seeing. And what we're seeing today is going to be magnified. But God can take us through it. Hallelujah. He can, do, he can open up the Red Sea. He can open up the Jordan. He can make water come out of the rock. He can cause manna to fall from heaven. Hallelujah. We just need to put our trust in the Lord and realize that God can do all things. One of the things that my pastor back home would always tell me, he said, you should believe enough in God that you can walk out that door with nothing more than the clothes on your back and believe that God will take care of you. There's nothing wrong with maybe storing up a few goods and so forth and all kinds of bullets and guns. We can have all of that. But I'm going to tell you what, when it comes right down to the nitty-gritty, God's the only thing that's going to keep us day by day. And we live in the age when God is going to pour out his spirit upon all flesh. And I believe there's going to be a revival in this place. There's that young man that's going to come to the house of the Lord. God's going to restore him. I don't know who he is, but God's got a plan for him. And when he walks in those doors, I want them to feel the anointing of the Holy Ghost. I want them to feel liberty in the spirit. And when everybody comes in, I want them to feel the joy of the Lord. Hallelujah. This is home. Finally, I have come home. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How many of you, I've heard people say, when I walked in those doors, I felt like I finally came home because I felt the fellowship and the love that was in the house of the Lord. Yeah, there's going to be discuss there's going to be kind of problems between us, but I want to tell you what, God's got a key for every one of it. Hallelujah. We're human. I'm human. You're going to see me make mistakes. I'm going to say stupid stuff. I will offend you. But hopefully we can work it all out. Can you say praise the Lord? Amen. Praise God. Because I'm going to tell you, the devil will do everything he can to divide us. And we have the spirit and we have the word. We have the knowledge and we have the anointing to take care of every single problem. Do y'all believe that? Yeah. Hallelujah. So when we have a problem, how do we go about fixing it? Do we just use like that, that uh, guy, the guy in the airplane says, well, this is what I see. Do you know sometimes what you see is not what you see? What you hear is not what you hear? The devil will twist everything up. He brings a spirit of confusion. I don't know how I got on this, but apparently God wanted it said, so I'm going to say it. We just need to recognize that we, I'm not going to allow anything to come between me and my brother or my sister. Praise God. I'm going to keep on serving the Lord because you let that get in there, and it's just like a sliver that gets into the, into the body. And pretty soon it gets infected unless it's pulled out properly. It, it can kill you. You think, well, how can a sliver do that? It can. Have I ever heard of staph infections? A little sliver can do it. Let's just gather around the front here for a few moments tonight. I don't often do that on a, on a Wednesday night. But we have done it here before. I just feel such a burden for, for the anointing of the Holy Ghost in our place. That we can hear the voice of God and feel the presence of God. That we can pray for God to lead us and to guide us into the paths of righteousness and keep us. Praise God. Now that I got you up here, I don't know what I'm going to do with you. <laughs> but I think one thing we could, we could do is just lift up our hands and say, God, let me be an open vessel. Let me fall upon that altar and be spoken. Let you speak to my heart, Lord, oh God.